Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Sharon, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Sharon. Um, I just want to thank my sponsor for um, asking me to do this. I... Uh, not much for speaking in front of people, especially for uh, 30 to 50 minutes, but um, God's going to guide me. And I really do need to, um, you know, it's been coming up in, in my 10th step, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, that I really need to start working with others in the way that I know that I could do that is to carry the message. So here I am tonight. Um, I just want to let you know a little bit about me. I came into the program a little over three years ago, and... Um, at that point, my uh, marriage was uh, failing. Um, my relationships, all of them, with my friends, with my family, were suffering. And um, I didn't know why. And I, I, it was everybody else's fault but mine. And it's kind of ironic that, you know, here I am doing the 10 steps today when three years ago uh, I would never admit that uh, I had any part of any wrongdoing in anything. Um, I came in, I grabbed a sponsor right away, somebody who had something that I wanted in my first meeting, and she ended up being a flight attendant, so I didn't really get to see her a lot. She was away a lot, and I was restless, irritable, and discontent, to say the least. I, I needed somebody there all the time, because it was like, being without alcohol, for me, was like um, learning how to walk again, or learning how to walk or crawl like a baby does doesn't know how. I mean, I had been drinking actively um, for a good amount of time. I started drinking when I was 12. So I didn't know how to deal with emotion, good, bad, or indifferent, without it, without alcohol or drugs or something. Um, not too long after uh, I met, uh, when I came into the program, I think three, three months in, I met my sponsor, who I have today. She was doing some work for me at my office. And she could tell in my voice that I really wasn't working a strong program. She she heard that, uh, you know, there was something. I was ready to drink, basically. And she said to me, you know, do you realize that if you drink again, you're going to die? And I was like, oh, come on, you know. And no, not me. I mean, I'm not one of those alcoholics. You know, I was different. Then I went home that night and I thought about it and I thought my god I could have died so many times driving drunk um, poisoning myself with alcohol mixing alcohol with drugs I was just lucky well not too long after I, I called her back up I said would you please sponsor me I really need to go through these steps and I really need to get rid of this this bad feeling inside so I started doing the steps and I did them kind of quickly you know, I, some people say, you know, take your time with the steps. I, I wasn't like that. I had to really jump into it and do them because I, I couldn't stand to live in my own skin. Here I was without drugs and alcohol, and and I couldn't. I was I was wired. I, I mean, I could barely function. I couldn't deal with um, my relationships. I couldn't deal with my work, and I was in trouble. So. I started doing the steps, and I think probably the hardest step for me was the ninth step, um, because I had, I had to go back, and probably like everybody else thinks that too, I had to go back and rehash some things that I really didn't want to rehash. And um, I know that I'm talking about the tenth step tonight, but I just wanted to read from the book, The Ninth Step Promises, because... I got so much out of doing the ninth step, even though at the time I didn't think I was getting anything out of it. I was petrified. I was slurring over my words. I was a mess when I was actually making the amends. But I knew that the promises were going to occur, and I just want to read those ninth step promises because it kind of leads up to the tenth step. It says on the bottom of page 83, we are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. I was sold on that idea. I was miserable 
I didn't know what happiness was. I couldn't remember the last time I was really, truly happy unless I was annihilated. So to, to have this without drugs and alcohol, I was, I was in. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. I was always talking about what I could have done. Oh, I should have done this. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, I'm just going to drink. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. That is my probably one of my favorite lines in the book. I just wanted peace. I just wanted to be able to function happily without having to worry about you know, getting high or drinking in order to, to deal with things. I just wanted serenity. And I didn't know it. My whole life has been chaotic. I grew up in an alcoholic home. And um, I'm actually the first person in my family who, today, who doesn't do some sort of drugs or alcohol as part of their daily regimen. Um, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. I didn't want to share a lot of my um, stories with people. I was really, really embarrassed. Um, and it says right here, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, you know, it doesn't matter. I remember walking into my first meeting, and I was thinking, oh, my God, these people are going to know I'm a drinking, drugging mother. They're going to take my kids away from me. I didn't know that the people in the meetings had the same issues as I had. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Um, when I came into the rooms, um, I had a friend who came into uh, the sister program here, Narcotics Anonymous. And I remember um, my best friend was uh, his his wife. And I remember her saying to him when, before he hit bottom, she was singing him that song by the Beatles all through the day, I me mine, I me mine, I me mine. And I laughed, ah ha ha, that's funny. Yeah, he is selfish. But really, when I listened to the words of that song and I listened to his story, I wasn't far off from that. I had no idea how selfish I was. Um, Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. Well, that sounded good to me. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. This sounded so wonderful that I decided, okay, I'm going to do this ninth step stuff. And I had such a healing experience with my ninth step. And it was so intense and that I, I stopped doing anything after that. I completely stopped. I thought, okay, well, I did all this. Do I need to do any more? Come on. I had to fly all the way out to Seattle and talk to some old boyfriend who wouldn't see me. But I had to leave a message on his answering machine. I had to do a lot of stuff. Give me a break. You know, I'm happy. Things are good. Look what I have now. And all of a sudden, things got shitty again. And I was calling my sponsor a lot. And, uh, you know, she was saying, well, where are you in your steps? Where are your steps? Oh, I'm on my steps. I'm on my steps. You know, I wasn't on any steps. I was resting on my laurels. Um, but anyways, she said, well, do a 10th step. And I was like, 10th step, 10th step, okay. And, uh, you know, I'm going to continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as I go along. Okay, fine. I agree with that. But I didn't do anything. I didn't, like, actually get a piece of paper out, and, you know, and, and do anything. I just kind of thought, thought it. This is an action step. And even though the ninth step is a major action step, too, and I wanted to take a break, I couldn't. I had to keep going. Um, and at the end of the promises, it says, Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. I'm living proof of this. I have such an abundant life today. I have three beautiful children that are very young. I don't, if it wasn't for a 10th step, I'd probably kill myself. Um, I have a four-year-old son and an a 18-month-old son and a um, nine-week-old son. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm busy. Mm. 
But I also have a wonderful business that um, I'm doing very well at. I have great employees. I'm I'm really blessed. And I sure I wouldn't have this stuff today if it wasn't for the steps and me taking action and continuing to keep what I have. And that's, you know, sanity. Um, so I'm going to read up as the, the 10 step starts on page 84. And it says, this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. I remember growing up, my father was always right, and that used to drive me nuts. He never apologized when he was wrong. If we caught him on something, it was like, oh, well, change the subject. I was doing the exact same thing. And the last thing I wanted to do was tell somebody, oh, I, I was wrong, you know, especially on a regular basis, daily. But I knew I needed to do it, um, and I couldn't let it go. My first experience with doing a 10th um, a, a step, uh, I realized that uh, I was at this party, and it was my friend's christening, uh, my friend's children's christening, and uh, there was, uh, his, his brother was there, and his brother is very handsome. He looks like Kevin Costner, and uh, You'd never know that this was his brother, because this guy, uh, my friend Jim, has like a mole here, a mole there. He's about 80 pounds overweight, and um, he's just not as attractive. And so uh, one of my girlfriends said, who's that? I said, oh, well, that is uh, Jim's uh, brother. I mean, can you see? You, there's no resemblance, you know? Isn't that a mirror? Whatever I said, it was very mean, and wouldn't you know his wife? was standing right there and she heard the entire thing. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, I was sober six months at this point. I was doing these steps. I was doing inventory, but I'm, you know, I'm not perfect. And it seemed like the right thing to do was to gossip to my friend about this guy and be mean. <laughs> well, it all came back in my face because she ended up telling him what I said, and he was very hurt and very upset. And, and, and you know, my original thinking was, well, oh, come on. You know, he makes fun of me. She's not nice to me sometimes. You know, we try to justify. Why should I set this right? Why do I have to be the one to, um, you know, say that I made the mistake? Can't we just let this go? But it was it was eating me up, and it was wrong, and I knew it. And I knew, and this is something that this group of friends always does. We make fun of this person. We make fun of that person. We, we, we make them look small to make us look big. And, and that's what I was going back into doing. So I ended up telling my sponsor about this because I wasn't sure what to do. I knew what I needed to do. I just needed a pep talk. And she said, you need to call up and apologize right away. And I said, oh, God, oh, wait, can I just wait, you know, do I have, no, you need to. And I couldn't. So she was actually with me when we were talking about this. And she said, make the phone call. Here, here's my cell phone. <clears throat> and I did it. I called up, and I, I didn't get him. I got his wife. I said, listen, I just want to say that um, that comment I made about your husband was really wrong. It was very mean-spirited and um, on your spiritual day of christening your, your child, and I apologize. And um, is there anything I could do to, to make it right? I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Well, she was so shocked. She said, oh, gosh, I probably shouldn't have even told him, and I made her feel uncomfortable. Um, she said, no, no, there's nothing you could, you could do. I, you know, it was nothing. But to me... It was it was something. It was, you know, me reverting back to my old behaviors, me hurting people, and I didn't want to be like that. You know, that's just not what I'm all about today. And and since then, I think I've gained a lot of respect um, because I think it took a lot of balls to say that and confront it. You know, we all talk about each other behind each other's backs, this group of friends. And now that I've stopped doing that, I think people um, look at me different, the whole group. So we vigorously commenced this way of living as we cleaned up the past. 
uh, I don't want to go back to where I was. It wasn't fun. I wasn't happy. Um, I had no respect for myself. If I do, it could be the next thing to a drink, you know. Um, we have entered the world of the spirit. Um, I always like the phrase that we're spiritual beings having a human experience as opposed to being a selfish Sally. And I, I remind myself of that throughout the day that, you know, if things aren't going the way quite like I like them to go, I kind of stop and say, well, this is the way they should be going. So, you know, let's just uh, try to deal with it. Um, our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. I pray for this every morning. Every morning I get up, unlike I used to, and I say the third step prayer, which is, you know, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do as thy will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Um, take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And if I find myself throughout the day certainly veering off this path, I really need to stop and, you know, say, okay, what am I doing here? What are my motives? Um, when these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately, usually my sponsor I discuss this with. If I discussed it with a lot of the people that I deal with every day, I don't think they'd understand. Not a lot of people are on a spiritual path, nor do they want to talk about one. And um, I find that the sponsor is probably the best person. And then my husband, yeah, that's not a good one either. He'll just uh, tell me and another thing you did wrong, you know. Um, and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone, um, which... I always let things go, and I hope, like, okay, I know I did this thing wrong, but if I let it go, maybe, you know, we could still be friends. Maybe if I don't bring it up, you know, we'll let it slide. And it's always there. Whatever bad thing that I have with another person, it'll probably always be there until I clear it up. And I want to, you know, be happy, joyous, and free. I don't want to have all that burden on me. So I do it. Um... Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. <coughs> Love and tolerance for others is our code. Um, I have this brother that um, he's uh, he's an alcoholic. Um, he's been um, working his own program for about seven years now. He's on marijuana maintenance. And um, he's actually rather sick now. He has a, a lung disease and... Um, I never really fully forgave him because um, he was pretty mean to me when he would drink when I was little. He's an older brother. And he never made amends to me. You know, he never tried to, to clear things up. And, um, and I was told a long time ago he was put in my life to teach me patience and tolerance. And I thought, bullshit, get him out of my life. You know, I don't want anything to do with him and I don't need to talk to him. And then I got sober. And I tried, you know, to talk the talk and walk the walk, but I still wasn't feeling it. And um, then all of a sudden, just this past year, I went to visit him, and I saw how sickly he was. And I finally understood. I mean, I knew he was had a mental and physical um, disease with alcohol, and I needed to be more patient and pray for him. But I, somehow he just still pissed me off because I knew he was an AA and he wasn't working a good program. But anyways, I finally saw, maybe because he has this debilitating disease with his lungs and he's on an oxygen tank, just how sick he was. And all of a sudden it came over me that, you know, I have patience and I have tolerance and I have a lot of love for this man, even though he really hurt me growing up. And he continues to kind of screw up, but I still love him. And that was huge. And I believe it's because of these steps. You know, I would never, ever feel that way without these steps. I didn't feel that way um, two years ago. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Um, what a relief. You know, we surrendered in step one. So, you know, 
why do I still fight things? And, you know, I, I certainly try to not fight anything or anyone, but sometimes you get caught up in the moment. Um, last week, one of my employees, um, she had an appointment at a, at, at 6.15, or 7.15, and I squeezed in an appointment at 6.15 to 7.15, and uh, when I came out, I, I apologized to her, I said, um, and to the client that was waiting that she was about to see, and I said, I'm, I really needed to squeeze someone in, it was, a, it was an emergency. And she said to me in front of the client, well, you know, we really need to stagger these things 15 minutes. And I said, okay, yeah, you're right, but hopefully we won't have these problems soon. And then when I went back into the room and I was trying to get the room ready for her, um, she said it again. She said, we really need to stagger these things 15 minutes. And I wanted to say to her, who do you think you are? I know we need to stagger things 15 minutes, but I had an emergency. Didn't you hear me? You know, uh, I could have gone on and on and on and on. And I said, you're right, and I'm sorry. I tried to set things right right away. I hated making amends. I hated it, and I want to avoid it at all costs. So if it means I have to quickly say, oh, you're right, even if I don't really think she's right, maybe it's the best thing to do, and then later on we could talk about it. But... I bring this into my business, too, the steps. I, I find it's um, extremely helpful. Um, for this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we will coil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically we will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. I can't remember the last day I wanted a drink. Thank God. You know, when you really think about that, I mean, a lot of us have, you know, a few years sobriety, and sometimes we forget. We get caught up in life and we forget. I didn't drink today, and that is huge. You know, I didn't take a drug today. Um, the other day I was driving and it was gorgeous and I had the three kids in the back car, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, you know, all with their, crammed in with their car seats. And I was listening to Sting and my windows were down and the forsythia was blooming. And I was like, wow, this is like being stoned. I used to love to get stoned and go for a drive. And you know, I realized, but I'm not stoned. You know, the best part is, I'm just me. I'm 100% Sharon. There's no additives in me anymore. And what a blessing. And I can't ever forget that. Because I was in a very low place before. No matter what things occur to me in life, I can't forget that. Because that's so important that I'm sober today. Um, and, it, you know, I remember counting people's drinks after a few months sobriety. I remember you know, going out to uh, dinner and, you know, oh, so-and-so had six uh, glasses of wine and the other person had two of that bottle. And I could tell you exactly, even though I wasn't really counting, <laughs> I could tell you exactly what they had because um, I just wasn't sober enough or I, I, don't, I don't know, I wasn't in a, a really good place. Um, I've decided now not to, to go out with that crowd anymore, but... Um, I honestly can't remember the last time I really wanted a drink, and that's pretty cool. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. Um, I Everything that I have gotten... So far in AA, the family, the wonderful relationships, the good business can all be taken away from me. And it says right here, we are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. So I know as long as I'm working a good program, as long as I'm taking regular inventory of my day, I'm going to probably be okay. Um, I don't. Unfortunately, I can't get to as many meetings as I'd like, and I can't hear the things in the rooms that I need to hear on a regular basis, so I really, really rely on 
the inventory um, at night and the morning meditation in, in, the, in the morning, the 11-step work that I do. Um, this, that is our experience. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. This um, step in this big book talks about spiritual condition several times, um, which is imperative to my sobriety. I know if I'm grouchy or mm, depressed or poor me, self-pity, you know, I know that I'm probably not in a good space and I probably need to evaluate what's going on. And sometimes it could come out of the blue. You know, a certain situation will pop up and it will make me afraid. And all of a sudden I'm doing so well and all of a sudden I'm afraid. Where did that come from? Well, for, you know, 30 years this is how I, I dealt with things. I, I reacted to things. I uh, When I couldn't deal with things I'd run away from them or I would, you know, try to uh, anesthetize my feelings with drugs and alcohol. And now I have to really, um, to deal with it. And in order to keep in a fit spiritual condition, I have to do these active steps. Um, it is not easy to let up on the spiritual program of action, and it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. Mm, I do that regularly. I will be the first to admit. I do. I mean, I feel I'm pretty good, you know, and, uh, I'll go through this and I'll say, uh, was I selfish, dishonest, and considerate, resentful? No, 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 no. And, you know, because I don't feel like doing it. I don't, I'm tired at night. I take care of three kids. I have a business. I could give you a million excuses. I fall asleep in the chair. I can't do this all the time. Um, and then I wonder why I'm freaked out the next day or, you know, I can't handle situations properly because I'm not regularly doing this. Um, Every day is a day. Um, what we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And just like I said before, you know, things are really great, but the things that um, got me into these, the things that I got from the rooms are the same things that could take me out, you know. I could, I could lose that family. I could lose the business. Um, I could lose my, my happiness. I could lose that great feeling driving around feeling stoned, you know, without being stoned. Um, every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How best can I serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. Um, the first uh, few weeks that my last son was born, I was pretty overwhelmed. Um, you know, I had some visitors, I had my mom one week, I had my sister another week, and I'm not really used to them because they're from Florida, and they're there, and I'm here, and, you know, it's okay. Every so often we visit. They kind of can drive you nuts. Um, but I found myself being a little afraid of being able to, um, take care of these kids on my own once they left. Um, you know, how was I going to do this? You know, well... God doesn't give me anything more than I can't handle. I would say that. And I'd say, you know, how could I, I best serve God? Well, to be a good mother and to get through this and to not be afraid and to put them in their car seats and take them out for a ride and not worry about somebody freaking out. Um, you know, take good care of myself, get out, get out and exercise. I just had a baby. I'm in bad shape. I need to do that, you know. Um, I had to be honest with myself and realize that I can't, I was, I was kind of, I was not going to meetings, and I was kind of going back into my old habits again of, you know, fear and um, self-pity and, you know, focusing on the problem and not the solution. And um, then I started to get around to some more meetings, and I started pulling out my inventory, and all of a sudden I was going to the gym, and I was taking the kids out more, and I was uh, doing a lot more, but... Um, I have to do some sort of step or action when things aren't working well for me. Otherwise, I'm a mess. And these are thoughts which must go with us constantly. 
We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. Um, I'm by nature a very willful person. Um, I like things done in my own time, certainly not in God's time. I uh, had this thing I think I shared with a lot of you. Um, I own my own business, and in the past three years, I've been in four different offices because of one situation or another, zoning problems. And um, it's, it's been a lot on me. And, I, you know, and, and I've been looking for a place and obsessing about a place. And then I'm also, I moved out of my condo and we've been looking for a house, but we haven't found the right house. So I'm obsessing about a house. And I'm, I've been letting the office and the house take away so much of my energy that I'm not being um, productive beyond that, you know? I'm not doing the things I need to do for my employees for the business. I wasn't doing the things that I need to do around the house. Um, uh, you know, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't effective, you know? If, if I said, I try to stop myself during the day and say, okay, you know, midway through and say, what, what would God think of me today? You know, am I doing okay? And uh, then I wasn't doing so, so okay, you know, and and something, I mean, uh, um, well, two weeks ago, I was going to make this purchase. And my husband and I have an agreement that whatever purchases I make over $100, I have to consult with him about. But I knew what his response was going to be about this. So, um, <laughs> put this 10-step sheets away, you know. Uh, so, um, it was very important to me, and I was too afraid to have a sit down, because it seemed like every time we brushed the subject, it was, rah, 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 you know, so I wanted to avoid that. So I decided I knew what was best. And it was eating me up. I mean, I was, I was a mess about this. Um, but finally the day came where I made the purchase and it was over with, and, um, I felt terrible. I was cutting the check, and I was like, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, I'm gonna have to tell him this. And then I realized, oh God, I have to, I don't have money in this account, I have to take it off from our other account. So he was gonna find out anyways, cause he was gonna see it. This was my own personal account. So, I said, okay, well he's gonna find out anyways. So, I'm gonna have to tell him. So, the evening came, and he was passed out on the couch. Oh, thank God, you know. I don't have to deal with that when I got home. I didn't have to talk with him about it. Well, the next day, I said, listen, I just want to tell you. I I bought something, and I spent a lot of money. And I know you didn't really want me to do this, but it was very important to me. And I know I'm supposed to consult with you about purchases over $100, but I really, you know, this was very important to me. You know, and it's like apples and oranges. And, you know, they say, oh, they're never going to respond the way you think they will. Well, he said the exact thing that I thought he said he would. You know, he said, but, you know, the, you know this is what we've, I've been through this. So I've known you since 1995. This is something that you've always done. We're trying to get a house. We can't get a house if you keep doing this. And, and I said, yeah, I know. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You know, and it all sounded perfectly fine. And I said, I don't know where I'm at right now. I'm in a kind of in a bad place spiritually, I guess. I guess I felt I, I needed to to lie to you, but it was very important to me and and I, I do want to um you know, save money for house and I do want you to be able to trust me. So I promise I won't do this again and I'm telling you this because I felt so bad that I did it. And he said to me, um uh, he said, you know, you do this, you do this all the time, but I see that you have made, you know, a lot of attempts to, you know, um, uh, set things right, and, and I appreciate it, and, you know, I'm glad you told me. And he was happy that I was honest with him. And then I found out some other things that he was holding back since we were having this heart-to-heart, -heart, which were really, 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 really helpful, actually. And, um, you know, it was, it was kind of like the two of us were kind of like, 
getting on each other's nerves in the past month, and, you know, we hadn't had any quiet time. We've been so busy taking care of kids, we didn't have any time for us and to have a serious conversation. Here I was opening it up, and this really actually strengthened our relationship. You know, it was great. And then I said, well, while we're at it, I did something else last <laughs> month. And uh, and then I explained why I did it. And then I also explained the things that I was going to do to, um, you know, cut back. You know, I, I gave up the expensive hairdresser. I, um, I'm i not thinking about vacation, which is so unusual. Usually I was like, oh, let's go on vacation. We don't have the money, so what? We'll charge it. You know, I'm not going to do that. Um, I was I was telling him the things that I'm willing to do in order for me to have made this purchase and do this because it was very important to me. And he realized that, you know. He saw that. And, you know, it, it wasn't like the old behavior all all completely. <laughs> you know, there there was some redeeming qualities about that. So we can't just be too freaked out, um, you know, and too worried in order to set things straight right away, you know. And that was something that, like I said, I always did. I would always freak out about it and think, well, no, I can't confront this because it's, it's too much and this person's going to react this way. I always knew how they would react. I mean, I never did. Um, and, and it would eat away at me. I mean, I'd be thinking about it the whole time when really I should just go up there and say, hey, this is this. I did this. I am sorry. Is there anything that I could do to make it better? And that's that, you know. But, you know, we get caught in our old behavior sometimes. Um, much has been, has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we have become God conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. But we must go further, and that means more action. I know what's right and wrong. When I'm doing it, I know when something's wrong. You know, when I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying, I know it. I just sometimes fall short and I say these things, or I do these things. And I'm better than I was three years ago, and better than I was two months ago. Because I try to utilize, you know, what's what's right and what's wrong, and try to say, okay, well, I'm going to make do without this, because this is wrong. I shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing this. Um, I'm going to withhold from saying that, because, yeah, it's probably not going to do me any good, and it would probably end up make, having me make an amends, so I'm not going to do that. I've developed, they call this the vital sixth sense, um, a, a sixth sense, you know, a way of just knowing that if I do this, this will be the consequence, when before it was a free-for-all, there were no consequences, you know, I just drove us in debt when I was drinking, and... um you know, didn't follow up or finish things that I started and um, was late for my appointments at work and um, uh, didn't get my new license uh, when it was expired. I just live life like, oh, God's going to take care of me, you know. I don't have to um, uh, be responsible for these things. And sobriety made me a lot more responsible, I must say. Um, I, did, I printed out these inventory sheets because um, <clears throat> when I, I shared before, when I first started doing a 10th step, I just kind of read the 10th step, you know, the line of it. <laughs> I didn't finish reading the rest of it in the big book. And um, so I didn't have any instructions. And for me, like probably a lot of you, uh, you're tired at night and you're busy, and if things are on paper for me and I have spaces to write in them, I'm probably going to do them. I remember the fourth step, the first fourth step thing I got. There were no spaces to write in them, so I, I was like, screw this, I'm not doing this. I'd have to get another piece of paper, and I don't know where that is, and I don't have to get a pen. And So this, I figured it would make it helpful for those of you who have never done a 10-step um, inventory, a formal one. This is great. I have two different ones because they're slightly different in wording, but it's basically the same thing. And um, 
at, next to my bed, I have this um, nightstand. And in there, I have my big book. I have, um, you know, my journal. I bought a new journal before the baby was born because I knew I was going to have to do a lot of 10-step stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, I have, uh, you know, your, your nail file, your regular stuff. But um, it's right in my and a pen and a lot of paper. And I have it, resentment inventory sheets because they always seem to pop up when I, when I feel like I need to do a 10-step um, written-down review. Um, and that is another thing. My resentment inventory has a lot of spaces, like I said. I think it's very important to have spaces to write this stuff down. Sometimes you have a lot to say, too. Um, so this spot check inventory that I have, it, it just you ask yourself some questions. First, it says, a constructive review of our day. This is only going to benefit us. It's not to be hard on ourselves. It's just going to benefit us. Um, being careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. Um, morbid reflection, like I said, you know, it's not the end of the world, these things. We're going to get out of this alive. My God, we quit drinking and we're still alive. If we go through this inventory, we'll probably still be alive as well. Um, and the first thing on here, it says, uh, was I selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate, resentful, or afraid today? Well, if that isn't the alcoholic. Um, and then you fill that in, you know, and be honest. I mean, how long, I don't know how long I kidded myself that I really wasn't an alcoholic. And then finally when I became honest with myself and realized I'm powerless over alcohol and my life sucks, then I was able to get some freedom here. So this Inventory has to be really, really honest and thorough. Um, do I owe an apology? And, and if so, you know, you might want to write that down in your 11th step uh, work the next morning in the morning meditation. You know, what do I need to do right away? And and maybe you won't do it that day. Maybe something will happen. Maybe you're, but put it in the next days and the next days, and then maybe finally you will do it. Am I keeping something to myself now which should be discussed with another person at once. Well, that was me last week. It was killing me. I knew I had to tell my husband. I felt so bad, you know, looking at him and just thinking, this poor guy has no idea what's going on, and I'm so sneaky. I remember my mom saying, oh, what they don't know won't hurt them, you know, and, and that's not good in a marriage. It really isn't, you know, you, especially with finances. They need to know everything. They really do need to know everything. Um, and if you wonder why you don't have a really good marriage or if things are a little rocky, that, that may be, you know, I know that for me, that's my experience. Was I kind and loving towards all today? What did I do to the person who cut in front of me? What did I say? You know, um, <laughs> my son, my four-year-old, we were driving, and before I said anything, this guy cut in front of me, and before I was able to say anything, he was like, that guy's a jerk, right, Mommy? He's a stupid jerk, and he should die. And I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, he didn't hear that from TV. He heard that from me. It came out of my mouth at one point, you know, so through the mouths of babes. Um, and have and have I, have I prayed for the people that, I'm not real happy about. That was real big for me before. I remember early in sobriety, um, I resented a lot of people. I couldn't stand a lot of people because you're, you're full of anger in early sobriety and you're just pissed and you really haven't finished your fourth step yet and you haven't made amends. You're angry. And, you know, someone said to me, well, pray for that person. Oh, give me a break. You know, I pray they die. You know, it was, but today it's, it's, you know, I really do pray for them, and I really do hope them well, and I really realize they might be sick, you know, if, or have a problem, and maybe, I have to believe that they're doing the best that they can. So towards everyone, I have to be kind and loving. Was I moody, you know, to the person at the YMCA who wanted all my identification, you know, uh, those types of things. Is there something I could have done better during my day? There's always something I could have done better during my day. I've never had a perfect day. 
Always. Um, I have three little kids that I'm home with all day. Sometimes I get the two little ones crying at the same time, and then the other one's asking repeatedly, uh, I want to do this, Mommy. I want to do this, Mommy. I want to do this, Mommy. And I'm trying to get, like, basic things done around the house, and I have to be very careful how I react. You know, I have to stay calm. I have to stay cool. And sometimes I snap. Sometimes I go, you know, I, I scream, and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, why did I, why did I say that? You know, and then I quickly say, I am really sorry, Jake. I did not mean to say it like that. I'm just very, I have a lot going on right now, and I'm really sorry. Mommy's really sorry. And I have to really make an effort to do that all the time because I grew up um, with a father and mother who would never apologize. Everything they did was justified somehow, you know, good, bad, and different. And um, that's not the way I want to be. You know, I came into this program three years ago because I was a drunk mom. Now, I, I want to be a sober mom, and I want to be a loving mom, and I don't want to be an angry mom. So I, I have to try to... And I don't want my kids to be afraid of me either. Um, was I thinking of myself most of the day? Well, when I wander into those things about, oh, what office am I going to have, and what house am I going to have, and oh, let me look on the Internet, and there's laundry piling up, and, you know, there's no dinner for my husband, and the kids are begging to play. That's probably thinking of myself all day um, for most of the day. Um, and that's when I realize to see this on paper is to realize I have to get out of that and I have to do stuff for other people, which is the next one. Was I thinking of what I could do for others or of what I could pack into the stream of life today? Um, did I call another alcoholic? Um, did I offer to do something for my husband that he normally does? Um, did I find that someone was in a bad spot and I needed to, you know, offer my services? Um, and, and did I do the things that I initially said I was going to be doing in, in my list that I made out in the morning? You know, the things that I was packing into my life, did I, did I accomplish any of those things? Am I doing those things? Did I avoid falling into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection today? Try to remain, um, I try to remain turning it over to God, you know. Um, I have this great life, and it's not, it wasn't something that I did all by myself. It was certainly something that God gave me. And... I need to turn it over to him on a regular basis, you know, and not worry. You know, uh, when I got kicked out of my office because the zoning wasn't right and I just painted this one office and just fixed it up and I was only in it for two weeks, um, I was worried. But I knew that that must not be the space that I was supposed to be in because this wouldn't have happened. Um, you can't fight fate, you know. Um, and it, it turns out I found this great office that I'm moving into next week. Uh, it took almost a year to find it, but it's it's a better office. It's got more space. It's it's more conducive to my finances, and um, it's it's I could have a sign. I could have a big sign. It's perfect. But then, when it was happening to me, when I got kicked out, I was worried. But if you think about, you know. Any kind of adversity that's ever happened to you, there's always something good that comes out of it. I have never had something bad happen to me, and I'm still suffering because of it. Something always good comes out of it. So there's no need to worry. He spent a lot of energy worrying, too. Did I remember that love and tolerance of others is our code? And there's a little prayer of tolerance here. It says, please, Lord, help me to believe that this person is doing their very best at this precise moment in time. God, save me from being angry, critical, or judgmental. Thy will be done. I had something to say about everyone. You do something somewhat wrong. I'm going to not tell you. I'm telling my friends, or I'm telling my husband, or I'm telling somebody else, because I was too afraid to tell you. Um, I remember coming into the program. It wasn't my drinking that my husband was upset about or, or, or anybody really. Well, 
I really hung around with a lot of drinkers. That might be it. If I had some people who didn't drink as much as me, they may have been concerned. But it was the behaviors that really upset people. And my husband, was just, his arms were up, you know, like, you're, you're always complaining about other people. You're always judging other people. You're, you're always angry. Why can't you just be happy? I just want you to be happy. And I got happy. And I want to keep that. So, um, you know, I have to understand that things aren't always going to go the way I want them to. People always aren't going to say the things I want them to say. Everything's not going to be the way that I think they should be. And I have to, um, you know, accept that. I had a client who um, would always show up a half an hour late. And, you know, it was I, I was really upset about that because... I always had an appointment afterwards, and I told her I would have to cut her short, and then she'd be angry about that. And then I would go home, and I would say to my husband, can you believe the nerve of this lady? Upset she can't have the extra time when I have other people, and she's a half an hour late. And, you know, my husband was just like, this this is great conversation, Sharon, but, um, you know, why do you even keep her? Why do you, you know, why don't you... Uh, make it so that, you know, you book her a half an hour earlier and just tell her, or, you know, the appointment is a half an hour earlier and, and maybe she'll be there on time, you know? <laughs> um, I would just, you know, I did these things too. I used to show up stoned for my appointments and I'm a massage therapist and I had this really small little room. I worked in a chiropractor's office and I would stroll in there stoned and late and, you know, I never would apologize. I would just be like, well, here you are to see me, you know, and I'm so important. Um, let's not talk about me being late because that would ruin things, you know. Um, <laughs> so here I have some people coming into my life today that are late. I need to deal with it, you know, somehow or another. <clears throat> Did my actions today indicate that I have ceased fighting anything or anyone? Like I said, I love that line because it's really like, you know, there's no point in this. Stop. Surrender. I'm not going to fight you anymore. And what a relief. If we don't need to fight with people, it's a tremendous relief. Um, now, uh, number 11 is, I am seeing that truth, justice, and love are the real and eternal things in life. Um, number 12 at times of anxiety, stress, or indecision today, was I able to stop, think, and ask God to grant me serenity to accept the things I could not change, for the courage to change the things I could, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, I know alcoholics have a tendency to react, and um, I tend to react, but I've gotten better. Um, I'll st if, if something stressful comes my way, sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, you know, um, to someone, I used to have to give them an answer right away or react to it right away. Something had to be done right away. Now I say, you know what, can I, can I just have a moment to think about that and um, I'll get back to you? That's huge for me. Mm. Because I'm able to <laughs> inventory it or something, you know, and see okay, that might have not been the best thing to say, or this might be the best thing to do. I'm able to get quiet with myself, because I'm not used to um, dealing with um, things coming at my way and me handling them eloquently. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not wired like other people, and I really need to remember that. Um, you know, sometimes I forget. I hang around people... <coughs> who I work with, no one's an alcoholic that I know of, certainly no one's in the program. And, um, you know, I see them doing things a certain way, and I think, yeah, I'm going to do things like that. And I can't. I can't. It's too much. I have a business associate who's buying a house and growing, um, expanding her business. And um, that doesn't work well for me when I do all those things at once. I, I can't multitask like that and be happy. Um, 
you know, I know she's on some medication too, which probably helps. <laughs> and I don't want to go on the medication, you know? I just, I just want to be 100% me. I know I don't need this stuff. Um, this other uh, thing is, has a lot of the same things, but it's a little bit different. And the things that are different is, um, you know, what am I grateful for today? I think it's important at the end of the day to have some gratitude, especially if you've had a bad day. Um, and I could honestly say at the end of every day the same things, that my life is abundant. I have a very loving husband who's been through hell with me and back and still loves me to death. Um, I have people who enjoy my company now, you know, like my siblings like to hang around me. Um, I have neighbors who want to be my friend, which is so weird for me because uh, I have this neighbor who brought over some split pea soup a few months ago and and I was afraid to have her in my house because I didn't know what I was going to say to her because she's not another alcoholic and she's not a freak and you know, I'm used to dealing with people who aren't messed up, you know, and she's not recovery, so what could we say? So uh, I, I finally started to uh, realize that that's ridiculous, and I've extended a hand. I've be I'm becoming friends with this neighbor friend of mine who has children, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, the other things I'm grateful for, I have, I have wonderful dogs. I have a business that's growing and thriving. I have um, um, people that I've, I've had a problem with before that I'm able to not, you know, to, like I said, to see that they might be sick and suffering and to, to be over that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, and I'm grateful today, for instance, I'm going to say that I'm grateful for the beautiful day we've had. You know, we've had such lousy weather. Sometimes we have to stop and see, you know, this is great. We, we could actually walk out without coats and without raincoats and, um, and life is good. Um, I believe that I have been blessed as a result of these steps. Um, and without them, I'd probably be dry drunk. I'd probably be drunk. I went to a meeting once in early sobriety, really early sobriety. I was like three weeks sober. And I wanted to go to a meeting that was closer to home. And I had been coming to meetings around here because I was told that the um, sobriety and recovery is very good up here. And... Um, I, I went with my neighbor, and we went to this meeting, and it was a big book meeting, and they hadn't started yet, and, but this one guy smelled like booze, and this other woman had this crazy laugh. She was heckling the whole time. Anything you said, she'd laugh at. It was really disturbing. And um, everyone was miserable. No one was happy. You know, you, there's smiles all over this room tonight, and there was smiles all over the rooms and, you know, the Baskin Ridge meetings I was going to, and, and it was like, you know, the people in Basking Ridge were actually on something because they were so happy or it was some sort of cult, you know, and I wasn't feeling that in this meeting down in Somerville. And we started reading the big book and all we just took turns reading it. Nobody shared their experience, strength, or hope. We just took turns reading it. And then all of a sudden there was a smoke break. <laughs> and I don't smoke. Actually, I used to smoke, so I really hate smokers. I hate smoke because I have to in order for me to quit or keep away from it. And... um then this drunk guy is hitting on me, you know, and and I'm like, this is a terrible meeting, and you know, and then I'm just walking out, and someone's saying, you have to have patience and tolerance of others, you know, and when I was running to my car, and I said, no, I don't, I need to get out of this meeting, but if I didn't have that meet that meeting, and you know, the the home group that I have, and know that there is, you know, hope for me, there is a solution. There's steps I could do. This is a program of action that, um, you know, I, I know that I would have met my friends down at Verve for martinis that night because that's where they were, my drinking buddies. I knew that. And when they invited me out, I, I said, no, I really, you know, I really need to go to a meeting. And, you know, so um, anyways, thanks for letting me share. I had a great time. <laughs>
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.